Hey guys, welcome back to Nurse Janks. In this video, we're gonna be doing some NCLEX practice questions. So let's jump right in. In this video, we're gonna be going over practice questions for the NCLEX. These are taken from the NCSBN, uh, and those are the people who work with Pearson View to deliver the NCLEX. So these should be very accurate NCLEX style questions for you guys. I'll actually link below where you can find the booklet that they put out that have all these practice questions and some more. So let's go ahead and get into the questions. All right, so the first question we have is, the nurse has been made aware of laboratory test results for assigned clients. Which of the following test results would require follow-up? So basically, this question is asking for something that is going to be abnormal. That's how we know it's going to be the correct answer. So if anything here is normal, we do not want this. All right, so number one, UA that is negative for protein in the client who has diabetes and is receiving insulin therapy. Um, okay, this is actually a good thing. We do not want protein in the urine. That means that their diabetes is hopefully being managed pretty well because that can kind of mess up the kidneys. But it looks like the kidneys are doing their job because there's no protein in the urine. So this is good. So we're going to move on because that's not going to be something we need to follow up on. All right, INR of 2.9 for a client who has a DVT and is on anticoagulant therapy. This is also a good thing. We actually want an INR between 2 and 3 typically for somebody who is going to be on anticoagulation therapy. So that's a good thing. So we're going to go ahead and move on. We don't need to do anything about that. A potassium level of 4.2 for somebody who's on Lasix. So this is great that they actually have a good potassium level on Lasix because that's something that can happen when you're on that. Your potassium level can drop. Um, but even if you didn't know that, you just need to know the normal lab value for potassium is between 3.5 and 5 or maybe even up to 5.5 depending on who you're looking at. But uh, 4.2 is going to be totally normal. So that's something that's very good. We don't need to do anything about that. All right. So... If we've already eliminated all these three, we already know that the next one is the correct answer choice. So let's go ahead and pick that one. But like, you know, let's say that we didn't realize that all these were, um, you know, bad choices so far. So let's just read this one here. We have acid fast bacillus who's prescribed um, prophylactic isoniazid. So this is something that is like a TB question. Basically, FB causes TB and they're already on prophylactic meds for TB. So the fact that it's not working because they're testing positive for AFB just means you need follow-up. But like I said, if you didn't know all that information for number four, hopefully you can narrow down, get rid of one, two, and three, and just pick four by default. All right, the nurse is caring for a client who has a prescription for VANC, one gram every 12 hours. They have one gram and 200 mLs of saline available. How many mLs per hour should the nurse set the infusion pump to administer the med over 120 minutes? So this is just a simple math question. Basically, we need to look at what we want as far as how to give the answer. So we need to come up with mLs over hours. Okay, so look in the question, find mLs. The only thing that is there is 200 mLs. So it doesn't really matter that it's one gram and 200 or what solution it is. All it matters is 200 mLs is what we have and we need to give it over hours. So what do we have that's similar to time? We have 120 minutes. Let's just convert that over to hours. It's two hours, okay? So basically we have to have 200 per two hours or 100 over one hour. So that's gonna be our answer because we need to go over one hour. So basically what you have to do is divide 200 by two and then you get 100. Very easy. You guys might not see too many math questions on the NCLEX because they're not that hard of questions. If you guys are kind of bad at math, hopefully it's not going to be something too bad. For example, 200 divided by 2 is pretty simple math. Um, basically, just try to figure out, you know, what do I need to get things into in order to give the answer to the way that they have it written. Um, but yeah, these aren't really difficult questions according to the NCLEX. So hopefully you're not going to be getting a ton of them because if you're testing above the passing threshold, you might just not be getting these easy questions. All right. The nurse is evaluating the effectiveness of the treatment regimen for a client with bipolar 1 who is experiencing manic episodes. Which of the following statements made by the client would indicate that the treatment plan has been effective? So if it's going to be effective, that means they're going to be saying something reasonable. We don't want a negative answer, essentially. Something like, oh, we need to fix that. So basically, what here is actually correct? All right, number one, I have to have my blood levels obtained regularly to monitor medication levels. I mean, that sounds pretty good to me. That's a very reasonable thing to say. All right, number two, I enjoy going on shopping sh sprees for clothing and jewelry with friends. That's not good. That's manic kind of behavior. Um, so that's probably not something that is good. That's not really effective. Next one, I avoid eating foods that contain tyramine. Um, this is actually something that you're going to have to be cautious about if you're on an MAOI antidepressant, but probably not something that you're going to be on with bipolar one. That's more like a lithium type of drug situation. So this one is maybe a distractor answer choice, but I would keep that in your mind. 
Number four, I'm too busy to sit down and eat a meal. Once again, that's very classic manic symptoms. You're too energetic. You don't even want to eat. So that's definitely not the correct. So we can easily eliminate number two and four. And then we're just basically deciding between one and three. But once again, the fact that number three is more for MAOI antidepressants um, versus number one, which is very uh, classic kind of like lithium, which per- pretty much always goes with bipolar, at least at first. Uh, I think number one is going to be your correct answer choice. And yes, it is. So that's how I would basically go between one and three is just think, you know, which one is more probably, you know, designed for bipolar. In this case, it would be lithium, which is going to have to have blood monitoring versus tyramine. Okay. The nurse has taught a female client who is pregnant about expected physiological changes. The nurse should follow up if the client states that which of the following is an abnormal or sorry, a normal finding during pregnancy. So basically we have to find out what is something that is abnormal that they think is normal because we're having to follow up. So basically we have to correct something. So something here is incorrect as a normal finding. So let's find out which one. All right, we've got constipation, painful leg, cramp, painful leg cramps, enlargement of moles, and a line of pigmentation on the abdomen. All right, so number three should immediately jump out to you guys as a red flag for skin cancer, possibly melanoma. The NCLEX is gonna want you to know that enlargement or changing moles is never a good thing. Basically, that is always something that's going to require investigation and follow-up, and it's not normal. So basically, number three is going to be your correct answer choice. Even if you didn't realize that constipation, leg cramps, and aligning pigmentation on the abdomen are normal, we just know always moles are not supposed to be changing or getting bigger. That's something that is never a good thing. So that's your correct answer choice for this. And that's how I personally would have even gone about it. Even if I didn't know much about pregnancy or something like that, I would just know, well, moles, that's obviously not good. So we'll pick that. And that is your correct answer choice. All right. The nurse has attended a staff education program about infection control guidelines. What of the following statements by the nurse would indicate a correct understanding of the program? All right. So we need to know a correct statement down here. All right. I'll wear a N95 when feeding a client with the flu. I'll wear a surgical mask when checking the pulse of someone with TB. I should wear a protective gown when entering the room of a client with bacterial meningitis. I should wear clean gloves when bathing a client with eczema who has draining lesions. Okay, Uh, we'll go through them one by one, but um, number four already sounds extremely correct to me. So I would say, you know, universal precautions. If you're giving somebody a bath, wear gloves. That's basically a correct statement already. So I already know that one's good. So let's just make sure none of the other ones sound like way more correct or something. Um, So... I'll wear an N95 for the flu. That's a little messed up. You don't need that. You just need the surgical mask because it's not airborne. It's just droplet. So that's not correct. I'll wear a surgical mask for TB. Once again, it's actually kind of the flipped effect of the first one. You actually do need an N95 for TB because it's airborne, not droplet. So that's not correct. And then I should wear a gown for somebody who's got bacterial meningitis. That's actually like the flu. It is droplet. So you need a mask for that surgical mask. So the gown's not going to protect you adequately. Um, so all three of those are incorrect. All right. So yeah, the one with eczema and the clean, uh, gloves is going to be your correct answer choice for this one. All right, moving right along. So we have the nurses received information about assigned clients. Who should we assess first? So this is a prioritization question. These lovely things, meaning there's a lot of things in here that might require uh, our attention, but we need to basically figure out who is the closest to death and who needs our attention the most because they're the most critical. All right. So whose respirations decrease from 16 um, one hour after a paracentesis, who has expectorated blood-tinged mucus six hours after a bronch, whose left leg is cool to the touch two hours after a cardiac cath via the left femoral artery, and who has shoulder pain five out of 10 after a lap coli. Okay, uh, let's just go one by one. Number one, whose respirations have decreased to 16. Um, respirations decrease, the combination of these two words is not good, but I think they're fooling you with this one because what did it decrease to? It decreased to 16. 16 is an absolutely normal respiratory rate. The fact that this is after a paracentesis is probably due to the fact that they're able to breathe a little deeper now because they got some of that fluid off, but 16 is not bad. So the, I mean, yes, respiration decreased is probably going to make you guys get nervous, but just, you know, make sure to read the whole thing. Decreasing to 16 is not an issue. Okay. Who has expectorated blood tinged mucus after a bronch? Once again, they're trying to scare you. We have blood coming up, right? We're coughing up blood. Um, but what kind of blood? It's blood tinged mucus. And it's after a bronch, which is going to create a little bit of trauma to the airway. 
So is it really that scary or is it kind of expected? The fact that it's not like tons and tons of blood, it's just blood tinged, tells me it's probably not super, super creepy. So, I mean, I would definitely still want to follow up just to make sure, but I don't know. It's not screaming danger, danger to me right now. All right, number three, whose left leg is cool to the touch two hours after a cath through the left femoral artery. This is a big problem here. We've got um, decreased perfusion to the leg indicated by it being cold. And it's right after a cath in the left leg. That is not good. That's something that's probably like a hematoma or something to the cath site. So this is something that actually is going to require our intervention. They might have to go back to the cath lab um, just to make sure that something didn't get punctured, the blood's not just leaking out because it's obviously not perfusing the leg very well. Or maybe they have a clot. I don't know. Something's wrong here. So this is definitely bad. This is my uh, best answer choice so far. All right, let's just finish up. Someone has pain 5 out of 10 after a lap coli. That is not that concerning to me. They have moderate pain, not even like totally severe, but basically on the NCLEX, pain like never kills people. So um, that's not going to be super, super life-threatening right now, but number three is potentially life-threatening. So we're going to go with number three. And that is your correct answer choice, but that's how I kind of narrowed it down to see who uh, I think is the most in danger. The nurse has been made aware of the following client situations. We should assess the client first. So another prioritization question. Okay. Diverticulitis, left lower quadrant pain, um, COPD with hemoptysis, evacuation of a subdural hematoma eight hours ago, and now is agitated and who has a total knee replacement and whose affected extremity is internally rotated. Let's just go one by one again. So diverticulitis, we've got left lower quadrant pain. This is actually kind of an expected thing with diverticulitis. I would expect it exactly to be in the left lower quadrant. And once again, pain never killed anybody. So I'm not going to pick this one right now. Let's go ahead and move on. Okay, we've got COPD who's reporting hemoptysis. That's coughing up blood. I don't like that. Of course, that's going to require some you know, investigation, but... Um, it's not totally uncommon that somebody who has COPD might cough up some blood from time to time or some TB, for example, that someone else who might be doing that or lung cancer or something like that. It definitely is going to require your attention, but I don't know if it's necessarily going to kill somebody right now, but, um, so far out of the first two, that's the best choice. Okay. Who had an evacuation of a subdural hematoma and is now agitated. Okay. This one's really bad. So we've got, um, bleeding in the like head and now we have agitation. So this is a double whammy. Obviously, if you've got any kind of bleeding going on in the skull, that's bad. But now we have um, a change in mental status. And so they're becoming agitated, meaning they weren't before, but now they're agitated. So this is a decrease in their status. That's a uh, double whammy. Um, so this is definitely the, the best choice so far because it's literally telling us like, wow, things have gotten even worse from the baseline, which was already bad. All right. Number four, who had a total knee replacement and whose affected extremity is internally rotated. Um, I'm not an ortho guy, so I'm not, you know, totally sure if internal rotation is a giant deal. But to me, it would probably say, if anything, we need to have ortho take a look at the leg and maybe that would be painful or just not ideal. But with orthopedic surgery, something that's life threatening is like a blood clot. Um, so if they're saying, I just had like any any kind of ortho surgery and now I'm having super trouble breathing, like gasping for air. That would tell me, oh, they had a clot and probably went to the lungs, gave them a PE. That's something that would be a total emergency, but they're not really saying that. So I don't think that this one is super, super critical right now. So I think I can not prioritize that because three seems more life threatening to me right now. It looks like they have an increased ICP. So I want three. Uh, I also like two. I think that you know, that's scary to see, oh, they're coughing up blood, but you know, it doesn't really give me a change in status. It just says they're reporting it. Um, I don't know how long they've been reporting it, but I know for sure that number three is actually telling me that they have a change for the worse. So three sounds even worse than two, but I'm between those two basically, but I'm going to choose three. Alrighty. And so that's kind of how I got to threes, you know, just saying, I know they're both bad, but I think three is even worse. So we'll go with that one. So hopefully that can help you that little strategy right there. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you have any questions for me, let me know down in the comments. I'll do my best to respond. Uh, like this video, subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.